Welcome to today's program, Together in Innovation, Agricultural Advances. My name is Deepak Deshera from the Office of Innovation Outreach here at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. We have a great program in store for you today. Before we get started, a long reminder. Together in Innovation. The first reminder is that for any reason, if you get disconnected, you just simply click on the link and you'll be reconnected to the program in progress. And the second reminder is that at the end of the program, we will display a QR code that will take you to a survey and you'll be able to provide us any feedback about today's program that we can use to make our future programs better. With that, I wanted to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Sylvia Blankenship. She's a fellow of the International Society of Horticultural Science, the American Society for Horticultural Science, and the National Academy of Inventors. She has been inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. She holds two patent, U.S. patents, 23 foreign, pat, foreign patents that are used in companies and products worldwide. She has published 65 reference articles and 12 articles for the public. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Sylvia Blankenship. Hi, thank you, Deepak, for the introdu introduction. I'm Sylvia Blankenship, and I want to welcome you to Together in Innovation Agricultural Advances. And I'm a retired horticulture professor, like he said, and an inductee into the um, National Inventors Hall of Fame for my invention that increased the longevity of produce and flowers. You know, when I've been in a lot of agricultural programs through the years, and so many times people start off by showing pictures of old dilapidated barns or antique tractors or farm equipment that's fallen apart. And I think sometimes that gives people the impression that there is no innovation in agriculture, which is in fact very wrong. I mean, there's lots of innovation in agriculture. And, um, and it's been there since, you know, the very beginning of, of the beginning of agriculture. And women have been a part of that right from the very start. They haven't always been real obvious, but they've definitely been there doing their fair share. You know, when you look at women in agriculture in the past, they would always be kind of hanging in the back of the room. They wouldn't um, feel like they could raise their hand and ask a question in a program or um, they would, you know, if there was a demonstration or a field day, they'd always be standing at the back of the crowd because they just, I think, many times didn't feel comfortable. I'm happy to say that's really changed a lot in recent years and there are women in every segment of agriculture now. And today's panel really represents that. I mean, there are people from government, nonprofits, science, um, of course, ag business, farming and ranching, the financial side of things. There's, you know, communications. There's um, the equipment, all of that. And women are now represented in every sector of, the, of agriculture, which I think is absolutely wonderful. There are so many pieces to agriculture that um, sometimes it's hard to, to realize that. But I hope today everybody will see that there are, in fact, wonderful inventions and women leading the, leading the forefront in many of these. And I'm very pleased to see it, and I'm excited to see today's speakers today. Um, I'm quite interested in hearing what they have to say. And so with that, let's get started. Thank you, Dr. Blankenship. Uh, and just a plug for the National Inventors Hall of Fame, if you happen to be visiting us uh, at our Alexandria campus, please visit the National Inventors Hall of Fame. They have some cool USPTO swag, like this shirt that they have available for purchase. All right, next, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Shavanda Jacobs-Young, Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, and Chief Scientist at the United States Department of Agriculture. She oversees over 8,500 employees across five organizations to create a safe, sustainable, competitive U.S. food and fiber system. 
She holds a Master of Science and Ph. degrees in Wood and Paper Science and Bachelor of Science degree in Pulp and Paper Science and Technology from North Carolina State University. Go Wolfpack. Please welcome Dr. Shivanda Jacobs Young. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. I'm honored to be with all of you today. And thank you, Deepak, for your kind introduction. Go Wolfpack. I love it that you and your colleagues have such a passionate commitment to furthering women's equality that you developed this program. And I know from personal experience that this kind of cross-fertilization leads to greater outcomes for our organizations and their missions. And I'm confident it will inspire as well as provide practical solutions for all of the participants in the audience today. In USDA, we recognize how important it is to ensure that our workforce and the agriculture sector in general reflects the diversity of the public we serve. Expanding the number and role of women in agriculture and ag science is part of that larger goal. We're committed to ensuring that the voices and experiences of women and girls are heard, represented, and valued throughout USDA. Well, it's, of course, the right thing to do. There are practical benefits to creating and empowering a more diverse workforce with women in leadership roles. First, women bring a different perspective to solving problems and generating ideas, leading to better results and higher employee engagement. Second, studies consistently show that women are perceived as uh, better communicators and more empathetic than men. And third, Women can serve as role models and mentors and help build supportive networks for the next generation of women ag professionals. And this includes providing critical advice on achieving a proper work-life balance, which as women we know is a major concern and a challenge. So basically every day, I and each of you have the opportunity to show young women that this is what a leader in ag innovation looks like. As someone who has spent decades in the field of agriculture, I'm pleased that you have chosen to devote a panel to agricultural innovation. It highlights the importance of innovation and the strengths of women in STEM. We have three outstanding entrepreneurs on our panel who will discuss their innovation journeys in agriculture. I can't wait to hear from them. Now, I wanna to say to our audience, especially the women in the audience who are working in ag tech or hoping to do so. These three panelists are terrific role models. Each has made a remarkable contribution to advancing agriculture, and each will share with you some of the lessons they've learned along the way. During the panel, you'll also hear about valuable resources women innovators can use to protect intellectual property and secure funding for their enterprises. As we know, we still have some long-standing institutional barriers to overcome. For example, ag tech. Women earn 61 cents for every dollar earned by men. This is compared to all labor sectors where women earn an average of 82 cents to the dollar. But there's some good news to report as well. In the various agricultural sciences, women received over half a bachelor's and master's degrees and that were awarded and 47.5% of doctorates. Now, by way of contrast, in 1966, women received only 1% of ag science doctoral degrees. These figures were among the highest rates in the field of science and engineering. As someone with an ag science doctoral degree myself in the field of paper science and engineering, I know the obstacles that women can still face in the science and technology space. And I've also seen that there are plenty of folks who are willing to lend a helping hand and offer words of wisdom, ensuring me the opportunity to achieve my dreams. Now, I've been committed to doing the same for others my entire career. Well, so on to the day, today and every day. It's simultaneously, let's celebrate the advances we've made and renew the commitment to continue and secure rights, freedoms, and opportunities for the equality of women. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get on with this exciting program. And so now I'd like to think, turn things over to our moderator, the amazing Amy Wu. 
thank you, Dr. Shafada jacobs -Yum. And uh, thank you for all the hard work that you're doing at the USDA. Um, and I would like to bring out the next panel uh, today. So if you could turn on your cameras as I call out your names. Uh, Suma Reddy, co-founder and CEO, Future Acres. Dr. Fatma Kaplan, co-founder and CEO of Ferenim Incorporated. And Dr. Pam Marone, executive chair and co-founder, Invasive Species Corporation Invasive and Invasive Species Foundation. Today's session will be moderated by Amy Wu. And Amy is an award-winning journalist and filmmaker focused on the agriculture and the ag tech movement. She's the founder of From Farms to Incubators, whose mission is to highlight women in food, farming, and farm tech, especially women of color. She is reported for outlets including Ag Funder News, Forbes, USA Network, uh, US Today Network, and Time Magazine. So I welcome you, Amy. Thank you for moderating today's session, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Deepak, for that really excellent introduction. And was I was really inspired by the uh, speakers, you know, that introduced this entire panel. It's a real honor to be moderating today's panel together in Innovation Agricultural Advances. We have an amazing lineup of uh, panelists. Um, so I think we're just going to like get started and jump right in so we can hear from them. Um, my first um, question, and I, I do see this as a dialogue and a conversation, is um, briefly tell me a little bit more about yourself. I know that Deepak introduced all of us, but tell me a little bit more about yourself and your company. And within that introduction, please include like some, uh, weave in some maybe domestic patents, trademarks, uh, along with your work as well. And I'm going to um, kind of go uh, start with maybe Suma, and um, then we can go to Fatma and then Pam as well. You're on mute. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so yeah, I'm Suma. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Future Acres. Um, we build advanced mobility solutions for farms. So our first product is really an autonomous harvest companion that transports crop um, across a field. Um, and so what it is aiming to do is increase harvest efficiency, uh, meaning more boxes picked, improve farm worker safety, because this is super hard work, um, per provide real-time data and analytics by having sensors on the robot and then reduce food loss. Um, so, you know, in terms of the challenge that we are solving within the agricultural space, um, you know, it's pretty varied, it's really complex, um, but it comes down to, you know, labor challenges being immense. Um, we're seeing sort of 20 to, to 40 percent um, shortages um, across many farms, which increase everything from farm revenue to, you know, kind of what gets on your plate. Um, and I learned this fun fact recently that uh, for many farms, they still use the wheelbarrow. And I'm talking about specialty crops um, as their main tool. And that was actually invented in 231 CE in China. Um, if you Google it, it looks exactly the same as the one we use on the farms today, except it's metal. It's not wood. Um, so it's kind of mind blowing, right, um, in terms of maybe how we can advance um, kind of tools in the specialty crop industry. So, um, you know, a quick background for me, I, I've always been interested in advancing kind of ag tech solutions. Prior to this was focused on building an indoor farming company, specialty herbs and leafy greens. Um, prior to that, I uh, was building renewable energy assets like solar, small hydro, wind. Um, but as part of that portfolio was working on a sugarcane waste to a uh, renewable natural gas project in India, um, taking 100 tons per day of that and converting that into usable, uh, us usable RNG. Um, so yeah, I've always been really passionate um, about this space uh, and really honored to be on this panel with all of you. Thank you, Suma, for sharing a bit about Future Acres and excited to learn a little bit more later. Um, how about Fatma? I'm Fatma Kaplan, CEO and founder of Fernim. 
We are using pheromones to control agricultural pests in the soil. I come from a farming family and I have an undergraduate degree in agriculture engineering, master's in horticultural sciences and PhD in plant molecular and cellular biology. After having uh, my PhD, I accepted a postdoc position in analytical chemistry chemistry where I purified and I identified the first sex pheromone of a model nematode C. elegans. After identifying C. elegans um, sex pheromone, USDA recruited me to apply this knowledge to agriculturally important uh, nematode pests, the plant parasitic nematodes. These are the bad guys that attack plant roots. At the USDA, I quickly learned that adapting a new a knowledge from a model system to agricultural pest was not easy. Despite the challenges, I was determined to bring this technology to the farmers because I believed in technology that it is going to make a difference in farmers' life. life. I also became an inventor in four patent applications while I was at the USDA. Three were US and one was international. Patent cost was not something that I had to worry about. Then I left USDA and started Farnham. When you are a startup founder and decide to patent your idea, the question you ask yourself, how can I afford to patent my idea? Oh, so many fees. IP lawyer fees for patent preparation, USPTO patent application fees, PCT fees, maintenance fees, office action fees. This list goes on and on and on. Even though I, I did contemplate um, preparing my own patent application, I was wise enough to work with an IP lawyer. While my co-founder and I was learning about patent applications on the USPTO website, we found out that micro entities had lower fees. At the beginning, Farnham didn't have any money. So uh, I used a personal line of credit to pay for the patent application fees. Thanks to, micro, uh, thanks to the lower micro entity fees, Farnham is, owns its own uh, US patent, which was granted in 2020. Now Farnham has five patent families that includes US patents, PCTs, and international patent applications. There are more to intellectual property uh, than the patents. My co-founder and I read a lot about intellectual property, patent applications, trademarks, copyrights, and uh, at the public library, on the USPTO website, MBA audiobooks during commute. And we learned trademarks were just as important as the patents. From the USPTO webinars, we understood the difference between weak and strong trademark. How to search for registered trademarks on the USPTO website, which is not very easy. And the difference between R versus TM, we developed a criteria based on these USPTO uh, videos, how to create a strong trademark, develop names for our startup. And out of 30 names, we had final three and one of them was Farnham. And we started out with TM, then by the time we were ready to file a um, trademark, uh, talk to our IP lawyer, uh, we had everything we needed in our hands. Thank you, Amy. Wow. Uh, Fatma, that was really comprehensive. And thanks for weaving in uh, some of the uh, advice as well, you know, that you had in the process and sequence. We'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, Pam. Great to be here today. I have a bachelor's and PhD in entomology. And then I started my career at Monsanto Company where I did some very groundbreaking work but was never included in the patents. And uh, so then I started an entrepreneurial career and uh, made sure that uh, uh, everything was, was patented. And because we're in a very, very uh, competitive industry, which is uh, crop inputs, I've spent um, decades developing three companies and now I'm actually start, started a fourth, but three companies in agriculture looking for my microorganisms and the natural products they produce to control pests and plant diseases and increase crop growth. And my strategy was always to, um, I don't care who invents it. I mean, I, I would, um, we had a lot of our own inventions, but often license technology from other uh, 
companies or institutes or, or government agencies have a, a major product that was licensed from USDA ARS. It's a bioinsecticide, it's a microbe. And I learned how to patent microorganisms and the products, the natural products they, they um, produce. And so I actually have close to 400 patents of which 40, close to 40 are US patents and uh, successfully was able to block other companies from coming up with similar inventions. And for the licensed technology, maybe there was a patent from the, there was one patent from the USDA for the Grain Devo product, a bioinsecticide, a new species of bacteria. And then what we would do is patent um, around that original invention and add our own um, inventions from the company um, from the uh, around the original licensor's patent and then uh, develop a very broad patent portfolio that would tend to block block others um, from getting. So we, we were able to really develop a, quite a number of products that are quite unique and were not basically imitated. Um, now my new com new newest company, my fourth startup, is focusing on doing the same, looking for microbes, and we also look for extracts of plants and other natural substances. And I'm, I'm deploying those for uh, controlling invasive species in water and forestry and agriculture. So I'm moving a little bit away from uh, from agriculture, but uh, so that's what I've I've done. That's uh, excellent. That's really impressive. For, that's uh, 400 patents <laughs> and, uh, you know, 40 U.S. patents, Pam. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the agricultural space. Um, what are some of the, as a woman, what are some of the unique challenges in the agricultural space? And um, how did you overcome them? If you can give a couple of examples. Who'd like to jump in? Maybe Suma? Yeah, sure. I can start. Um, so when I jumped into sort of outdoor ag, and I'll, I'll kind of bifurcate these, indoor ag was a little different. Um, you know, operating out of New York City, it was a bit more of a diverse space, but it was the intersection of tech, right, and agriculture. Um, and I think we, we know already tech isn't diverse and agriculture is even less diverse. And then when you get to hardware and robotics, it's even less diverse. So, um, so I found it um, pretty unique. I mean, how I've been able to address that is really just finding supportive uh, communities. Um, within outdoor ag, I will say I did feel nervous coming into the space because, you know, unlike uh, Dr. Kaplan, I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't have that farming experience, that sort of generations, right, that we like to tell that story of. I, I think I could tell it about my you know, ancestors in India, right? Everyone used to be a farmer, right? So I can kind of go back there, but I'm American, right? And so, um, so for me, it was really about developing um, relationships. And I found growers, I found academics, right? I found scientists, um, who I think, you know, like we're just very supportive of, of folks like me coming into the space who didn't necessarily understand the crop perspective as much as they did, but were willing to educate me and, and kind of understood that the growth of the agricultural industry means in also growing the technology industry, also growing the scientific industry, also growing, you know, and so it kind of has to diversify in that sense. Um, all that said, I mean, I, I do like to say, and hopefully it can be proven wrong, that I'm the only queer brown woman CEO in agricultural robotics. Um, so please prove me wrong there. Um, I would love for that to be false. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate you sharing a bit of your story and background, um, Suma, and 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 sort of uh, you know how you've um, overcome some of that, and also how you got into agriculture. Uh, I think we're going to move on to maybe Fatma share a little bit more uh, about some of the challenges you faced. I would say fundraising is a challenge, mm -hmm. and for a lot of founders, but in agricultural space, it's even bigger challenge challenge for women. And particularly when you're immigrant and with ethnic names, that makes it even bigger challenge. And the environment is not as friendly as, you know, one would hope. But in my case, I usually focus on my strengths and I also look for programs that are aligned with my strengths. One place is um, I focus on the grants because um, the award criteria is 
better defined and it's less subjective. And uh, I believe that reviewers are not distracted by their biases and they can just focus on the project. And then I also look for organizations, whether they have minorities, women and minorities in their staff. And then where are these women located? Are they in leadership positions? That gives me an idea how the organization thinks about women's place or the diversity's place. Then it gives me an idea how to strategize. <laughs> Okay, that's wonderful. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the support organizations a little bit later that you guys might suggest. Um, Pam? Yeah, I agree with Fatma. It is very difficult for women to raise money. I advise uh, quite a number of startup women founders, and it's it's kind of a passion for me since I started out my started my first company in 1990. So it's a long time ago. I have raised a lot of money, over $300 million. Took my third company public and raised $100 million on, on, the, on NASDAQ. But it is very challenging for women to raise money that's for sure but I needed I needed a lot of money to do what we did because it takes millions to to develop our products um, not as much as chemicals which is hundreds of millions but um, I had a patent budget of about a million dollars a year for all the companies three companies that I started so it's it's um, it, you need a lot of money to have to build the kind of patent portfolio and blocking patents that you want in this very competitive um, ag bio industry. One of the things that became a challenge was um, the Supreme Court um, ruled in a case called the Myriad case. It's very famous that you basically you can't patent living things. So how do you patent a microorganism? Well, that was a challenge. And with our very top patent attorney, which we had, we always found patent attorneys which had PhDs, um, JDs, and figured out how to make the claims in order to get patents. So yes, you can patent microorganisms as long as you're doing something different to them. You're not just patenting what's in nature, but you're isolating them or finding the compounds that are produced by them, etc. So um, that, that was a, a big challenge. The other challenge was, although during my first part in Monsanto, I did some pretty groundbreaking work, developed the first artificial, successful artificial diet for being able to do high throughput screening for proteins to discover proteins to be able to engineer into plants um, for corn rootworm, um, and uh, but was not um, not put on any patents. So um, looking back on that, we were called just support people, being the entomology group, and it was more than support. There was I did participate in something that was part of that inventive step, and I learned that. Mm -hmm. And so made sure that um, we had the right inventorship for all of our inventors in the companies they built. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I want to actually focus um, on the topic of funding um, a bit here and take a, a little bit of a deeper dive. So to have a really robust patent portfolio, you obviously need to have funding, <laughs> uh, among other things. So um, it's, I want to work my way backwards with Pam. A little, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how you ended up um, getting some of the, how you ended up raising so much? What are some of your uh, secrets on how, and on fundraising and also how did you get funding basically? Well, I started all the companies with friends and family and my own money um, and friends and family money. Um, and then um, got far enough along proof of concept to attract investors. But way back when looking for money, AgriQuest in 95, um, it, there, <laughs> the internet was just starting. I'm seeing I'm that old. So, um, you know, I just, I just um, basically, I cold called investors. And I cold called a very venerable investor, Don Valentine in Silicon Valley, who's now retired, one of the biggest venture capital firms. And he gave me, he took my phone, he's probably figured, who's this crazy young woman who's calling me out of the blue? Well, he gave me a name, Wayne Silby, who was chairman of Calvert Fund and Calvert Social Ventures, which was the, one of the very first um, environmentally and impactful, socially responsible venture funds. And um, he said, well, you're not in business, uh, Wayne. I called Wayne. He said, you're not in business even a year. So when you, come, when, you, when you hit a year, come back. And then we have a network of like-minded, socially responsible investors who invest in women and minorities and environmentally responsible businesses. And you can pitch. And so that got me off. off you know, that, that I pitched to the group. And um, they had provided a boot camp for us. And I took it very seriously about how to do this. They had 
rules for how, you know, how you put your slides, the size of the font, the colors and all of that and practice, like, you know, practice and practice and practice. And then I did a really good presentation, if I say so myself, back in that day and uh, attracted uh, Rockefeller and company that had a $300 million fund focused on women and um, environmentally responsible businesses. So that got me off the ground and raised um, 4 million. And I figured, learned I was good at it. And, and how, how, how was I good at it? Well, investors like to see the passion and you could sh- create, tell a story and the passion about your business. And um, and also they did, they did like that passion, all of them. And so it's a sales job. You are a salesperson when you're raising money. But also I work very hard. Entrepreneurs underestimate how much time it's going to take to raise money. And I had to, to you have to hit maybe more than 100 different investors to find the, you know, the ones that are going to uh, invest and lead and want to lead your round. And so I work. More, worked hard, worked harder than anyone, and uh, I think you know that's the advice I give to the to the to the um, entrepreneurs that I advise now. It's going to take you nine months, maybe twelve months during a, a, a downturn. And I went through nine eleven, where I was taking AgriQuest public, and that didn't happen because of nine eleven. Went through uh, two thousand and eight downturn, COVID. You never know what's going to happen, so um, uh, you just got to keep at it. Yeah. Mm, I like that. You just have to keep at it. Fatma, do you have any stories about how, how you, how'd you get funding? Oh, I must say, <laughs> oh, like Pam, investor funding is so hard. And at least for me, um, it's, uh, I, you know, whoever I talk to, particularly women entrepreneurs, they all say it is difficult and it's difficult for me too. And I was in luck with accelerators and um, some of the fellowship programs. So I keep my eyes open um, fairly frequently. And, you know, you talk to a lot of people and everyone, you know, gives you some advice and they introduce you. Like Pam said, you have to network a lot and you have to talk to a lot of people. You don't know. Uh, which kind of opportunity will show up. But I also have the targeted ones that while I'm working on the investor funding, I'm also targeting the grant funding, the programs that um, aligns with what we are doing and, you know, programs that really focus on the our technology. Mm. And I apply to multiple different programs. I don't just say, oh, you know, we're a really good fit for this program. It's like, it's just written for us. It never happens that way. So I usually apply three to four funding. And we're also ready um, to move forward. We have a plan. As soon as we get funding, we move forward Uh, because funding is hard. So we don't waste any time and working hard. And working hard, that that's, uh, seems to be a theme uh, that's important to funding, getting funding. The SUMA, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, your experience with, with, with getting funding, especially for future acres? Yeah, absolutely. I um, want to echo the, it's wildly difficult. Um, and right now, you know, we are in a, a downturn in terms of the funding uh, environment. Valuations are plummeting. Um People who used to invest in pre-seed are now looking for seed metrics. Um, so how we're contending with that for future acres is, I mean, one, um, there's a lot of different types of capital, right? Non-dilutive and dilutive. And so um, like Fatma, Dr. Kaplan, uh, we also are looking at federal and state, you know, funding and what opportunities there. Um, the second bucket we look at in terms of dilutive funding is these accelerators. And so, you know, we're part of the Elemental Accelerator Program, which focuses on climate tech solutions, a lot of them deep tech, hard tech and infrastructure. Um, you know, and that comes with the, you know, a 350K check and an incredible program. Um, on the more like traditional VC side, um, what I have found is kind of creating a persona of the type of investors I want. And it really is five buckets. Um, 
You know, one is the robotics, hardware, deep tech investors. Um, so they understand the tech, but they don't necessarily under, understand agriculture. Then the, the food and agriculture investors. Um, a lot of food investors are understanding the system systems level challenges and understanding they should, probably should be putting some money into ag. Um, the third is climate. Um, and so climate, right, has become broader from back when it was clean tech. Now it's climate tech. Um, I still sometimes have to fight to say, hey, we are a climate tech company because ag is food, soil, water, and ag, even robotics, right, um, has a relationship with climate. Um, the fourth is impact. Um, I love impact investors. They've been at this for decades. Um, and so they really are about the cause and the mission. Uh, and then the fifth um you know, to Dr. Marone's point, right, around DEI and diversity. So the, these women investors or people of color, uh, you know, and so I found that those are the ones also who I'm attracting. So, you know, I think being targeted among those groups, having a story, being passionate, um, you know, that with with all of these, um, but you can't hit hitting metrics, right? And so I think metrics are really, really, really important. So, you know, uh, for us, that's that's getting our product to an alpha stage, a beta stage, like showing true value proposition, right? And then turning on revenue, right? And being able to show letters of intent. Um, and those metrics um, have become more important, say, from like 15 years ago, when you hear these stories of, I raised a million dollars on a, you know, idea. I don't think that exists too much anymore, uh, unless you are a serial entrepreneur, perhaps, um, or you're hyper connected. Um, but these days, I think you really have to show, you know, to Dr. Kaplan's point, um, development and progress. Uh, so what I'm hearing is it's a lot more challenging in this climate today. And then, but there's more than one route on the positive side, there's more than one route to getting different kinds of funding, but passion is really important. And, and it's something that's really consistent. So I'm sure there's some folks out there, some, uh, maybe some women, you know, <laughs> entrepreneurs who are really, who are interested in, uh, in uh, moving forward and they're a startup. So I want to dig a little bit deeper on some advice for them. What might be some specific uh, women entrepreneur support organizations or associations or programs that have helped along the way? Um, some of you have alluded to accelerators um, and other sort of programs. Can you each offer a couple of suggestions? Yeah, I can start with uh, Springboard as one. Um, they're more life sciences focused, but they will take you if you're ag tech. And it is focused on um, training. It, there's boot camp. You go through you training, how to raise money, um, how to pitch, et cetera. Um, that's one for women. Um, and uh, But the other two have been in more. I, I advise a number of, of women now who are like that are in a lot of accelerators and incubators. And so I think the other two have have more ex direct experience because I'm so old that I they weren't around when I first started. There were no accelerators or inc incubators. Springboard was the first one, and that was like 2000-something. So anyway, I'll turn it over to the other two. Mm -hmm. um, Fatma? Um, I do have actually a lot of experience with incubators and accelerator, and I did benefit from them a lot. And many of these organizations actually have a really um, diverse founders. And all of them actually did help how to um, prepare pitch decks and how to present. And these organization, one of them is Activate Fellowship. I'm currently in. This is for very early stage um, entrepreneurs where they're not quite investor fundable, but they get you to the stage that you would be investor fundable. I was at IndieBio. I really loved IndieBio. And each actually provided very unique things, even though they all look alike, but uh, what you get out of it is very different. And with IndieBio, what I liked is the um, founder network. We still, we are still are connected and we uh, make really good bonds with the other uh, founders. And UC Davis Venture Catalyst was a really great program. And let's see, yeah, Thrive Ag. And Thrive Ag is, I would say, it's a little later stage, not as early as Activate. And Indie Bio is a little early, a little bit middle. Um, you know, you have to try. 
see uh, what you think versus what they think what stage you are is always different and definitely try even if you think you're not ready um you should let them decide too in the meantime that's great thank you um suma yeah um so from my experience, um, Elemental Accelerator as a climate tech accelerator has a food and ag portion comes with, you know, a lot of money, uh, relatively for an accelerator, right? $350,000. You'll see a lot of accelerators give a hundred, um, K, maybe a unique one will give 250K. Uh, and then you'll have the ones that don't give any money. Um, so you better make sure their program and their network is worth it because it is time consuming uh, if you actually uh, are a part of it. Um, others that I have looked into and been approached by is Generator, G-E-N-E-R, the number eight, T-O-R. Um, so they have an ag accelerator. They have a sustainability accelerator. Um, so that one looks super uh, interesting. Um, Techstars, uh, which many of you might know uh, because they're in that sort of Y Combinator, right? Uh, kind of level of, of um, uh, notoriety, right? In our, in a good way in our industry. Um, but they actually have a farm to fork program as well for the ag industry. Um, so what I have found, like compared to say 10 years ago, is there is so much out there, but like everything, you have to be able to find it. So just network, 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 and people will send you these applications. Um, I think the other piece is like pitch competitions, right? They're happening all the time for women. Um, you know, I'm part of one for the women who tech, you know, pitch. And it's a very, you know, relatively small sum of money, money if you win. Um, but, you know, 2000 applications and was one of five that was selected to pitch. And, you know, I think my role is not only to grow my company, but also grow the industry. Right. And so I'd love to see women who never thought about agriculture um, or hard tech coming into the industry and saying, hey, how can I contribute um, or how can I learn more? So. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a couple of those. I think the last one is support sort of support community organizations. Um, I would love to see more of these um, specifically within agriculture. I think I need to find them. But uh, two that are non-ag have been lesbians who tech. Um, and then I started a group called Women Who Hardware. So I think these things are out there. But again, you need to you need to be able to find them. And those become um, very invaluable, at least for me uh, on a personal level. I forgot two more. One yeah. is plug and play. Oh, yes. I'm just getting into ag and I do have a company I advise that it went through there and, and found it very good. And another one went through ag launch. Oh. Um, so those are two that are very important for ag. Um, and then one organization I should have mentioned it earlier is the Association for Women in Science, AWIS amazing resources that they push to you uh, daily or weekly um, about being a, a, just a woman in science in general and, and all the bias around that and tremendous resources. Uh, uh, I served on the board and longtime treasurer and uh, I, I recently resigned because I, I was on for so long, but uh, it's, it's a great organization. I highly recommend becoming a member. It's great networking. Mm -hmm. Well, these are great. These are real gems uh, for resources and a really, uh, a really awesome list. Um, we're winding down a little bit, and I want to turn back to patents and trademarks a bit here. Um, what are maybe one or two pieces of advice that you would give on how to go about getting patents and trademarks? Well, the patent system is really is really good now for entrepreneurs because you can file a provisional patent for a very low amount of money when you think you have something that's, that uh, you have an invention and then it, you have 12 months to fill in the data and then file a real patent. And so, um, you know, that, that's a really helpful system. Remember that a few years ago, the U.S. went from first to invent, from first to invent to first to file. Joining the rest of the world, so that means um, before when you first to invent, you could take your time to file. Not anymore. So if you think you have an invention, you need to be quick about filing. But that provisional system is low cost and easy to do. You can even—I mean, I know some of my entrepreneurs that I advise just did it right online themselves um, mm -hmm. and were able to get patents that way. That's that's great. That's very positive, um, Suma. 
Um, I do not have the depth of experience uh, that Dr. Maroon has, but I would say, you know, one of the things that I, I focus a lot on the commercialization of technologies. And so our strategy right now has actually been working with a professor um, who filed for a patent out of uh, UC Davis. Um, so I think there's unique ways, right, um, in which to commercial commercialize technology. So my Maybe my uh, advice would be, right, if you are an entrepreneur or want to be an entrepreneur, right, um, there's way that if you don't develop sort of the patent yourself at the first stage, right, we have an IP strategy and we imagine over five years what that might look like. Um, but our first step was not reinventing the wheel and, and finding these, you know, amazing um, academics and partners, um, whether they're universities or institutions um, or professors uh, to partner with to launch. That's great. And Fatma? Patents are expensive. So um, I would say, um, do, like um, Sue mentioned, um, definitely search whether you know it exists and try to find partners and have a good IP lawyer. And um, they are very expensive. So <laughs> search for a long time at least the one we currently have we've been searching for three years and the fees are really expensive but we finally got a really good one and it has been helping us out definitely you know with the patents the 12 months that for um you know a provisional it passes really really fast the minute you filed you have to be really on it and writing patents, that does take a long time. So you don't actually have 12 months. So don't really think when you do provisional, you got 12 months. That one year when you're an entrepreneur, when you're dealing with fundraising for the company and trying to get R&D, finding place, it's such a short time. So you have to be really on top of it. But, you know, it has helped us. But at the same time, I've worked with an IP lawyer. And don't ignore the um, trade secrets either, which mm. is cheaper. And look at it at many different aspects, how you can protect the IP. Sometimes copyrights could be a really good one because patents expire. And what other ways you can actually protect that IP and how you can extend it. Oh, that's really, really excellent advice. And everything takes longer, right? <laughs> than we think it'll take. Um, so finally, to wrap up here, uh, what would be one piece of advice for future uh, future women entrepreneurs and innovators in the ag in the ag or ag tech space? What would it be? And I'll start with uh, Asuma. Yeah, I think uh, mine would be it's a uh, it's not a sprint; it's a marathon. Um, so just take baby steps uh, towards what you are going to build. Um, you know, I think when I first got into this space, I I thought it would be much quicker than, than it was. Um, and that was because I was probably influenced by media uh, and stories. And things only get to media when you hit success. And that oftentimes is four, five, seven, ten years, right, after um, something is founded. Um, so just be patient. Um, if you are committed to this, you will be committed. And, and I think another piece of advice is um, if you're going to jump into something, um, you know, think of this as a five to 10 year journey. Uh, this is not a one to five year journey uh, unless, you know, you're building a Yo app or, you know, something like that. But with our kind of stuff, uh, think of it at least as a five to 10 year journey. Uh, and yeah. And good luck. Um, you can do it. I would love to see uh, more women and, and diverse entrepreneurs in this space and uh, happy to talk to anyone. That's great. Pam? Uh, I think it's important to pick your partners, your co-founders, employees, and investors and board members who share your values and share your passion for building a better world. And I, th I think that's that's really, really important. I've made mistakes all along that front on the people side, my biggest mistakes. And um, and so you want to, you, what drives me as an entrepreneur is building something that helps the planet and, you know, makes agriculture more sustainable, but also building a company with a culture that is 
and I what I think is the ideal culture and how we treat people. And um, that's why I'm a serial entrepreneur, so I can keep getting it better each time. And so, but that that you will make mistakes on the hiring and the, and finding investors and so forth that don't fit. And it, it's important to um, to move on quickly from that. So, following your passion, um, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur right now, especially for female entrepreneur. There's more women starting up companies in ag, ag bio, life sciences than I've ever seen before. Um, and and uh, a lot, and that's because it is a time where women and and especially younger people want to do something that is impactful, um, and and so they can do that best with uh, starting a company. And you don't have to be a founder. There's a lot of startups still getting a lot of money, even though it's more difficult. But there's some there's a lot of money in ag right now. Climate tech is the big buzzword. Carbon sequestration, you know, anything around climate, smart ag is still is still getting a bit of money. So. Um, it, it's just a great time. Oh, that's excellent. Um, and Fatma? I agree with both Suma and Pam. Startup takes a lot of time and money. <laughs> and uh, I would say um, utilize all the resources your business ecosystem uh, offers, like incubators, accelerators, um, Marketing law firms, because they do have different um, deferred payment systems, sometimes advisors, mentorship programs, um, I benefited from all of them. And if it hadn't been for the mentorship programs or the accelerators, uh, incubators, uh, I don't think I would be able to make it. But at the same time, startup has a lot of ups and downs. It's mostly, you know, oh, you know, whether it's going to work uh, or not is it's not going to work part is a lot more frequent. The downs are a lot more frequent. So um, surround yourself with positive people who believe in you, your mission, and willing to help you. And definitely positive people. You need those positive people. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all. That was just, uh, that was an amazing dialogue. A lot of, a lot of gems of information and a lot of good sharing of knowledge. So I'm going to hand it back. Uh, to Deepak. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you, panelists. That was a wonderful program. Yes, patent fees can be very expensive. Uh, and if you're thinking about doing the patent, I'm going to do a shameless plug for our patent pro bono program. Please go check out www.uspto.gov forward slash free services and click on the patent pro bono program and see if you qualify these are legal professionals who are volunteering their time to help you with the patent process. Thank you again, panel. Thank you again, Amy. You were an awesome moderator. And thank you again. That is, this has been an awesome, awesome experience for me and for the audience. And uh, thank you. I will now ask our next speaker to please turn on her camera. And I wanted to give a warm welcome to Dr. Tammy Gray Steele. She's a fourth generation black woman farmer. She's the CEO of the National Women in Agriculture, uh, in Agriculture Association, the largest minority nonprofit agriculture organization in the world. Their mission is to engage minority youth and female farmers to reach their fullest potential as they advance in agriculture, providing the life skills, career opportunities, and mentorships needed for them to become prosperous citizens. I bring to you Dr. Tammy Gray Steele. Hello, everyone. And again, I'm not sure if my camera's on because it's not showing on the side. Okay. Yep, go ahead and click on the start video button. Thank you. Okay. Am I there? Okay. Well, greetings, everyone. Again, thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I definitely feel underqualified with all the wonderful panelists and learned so much about patents. Um, as you mentioned, our organization is the largest minority nonprofit organization in the world. Um, we have over 77 chapters nationwide in the United States and 20 overseas and counting. So all of these wonderful panelists 
Um, this is a great opportunity. I feel that, um, that we can introduce to underserved women farmers who are out there doing wonderful things in their communities. But as our organization, we came together to highlight the work that they're doing. And some are, you know, socioeconomic, educational backgrounds are not as stellar as the women that were just speaking. However, they have a great contribution to society or to their communities, as well as specifically to our children. Right now, um, I was recently um, inducted into the Biochemical Smithsonian um, Museum for my work or contribution to um, the next generation of farmers, um, giving specific highlights and innovation um, programs that I have, specifically one called the Jade Program, Junior Agritive Education, as well as the Hip Hop Producers. Again, these are specific youth programs as a pilot program to 4-H and FFA for at-risk youth. Um, my research has found that since 1914, through the Smith-Lever Act, minority youth have not um, been included in the sustainable life skill opportunities that these great, awesome youth programs have. Therefore, we are requesting whoever's help that's out there to speak to our president. We've gone back and forth to Washington, D.C., to the Hill, speaking to congressional leaders to hear our plea to become also a the first black congressional chartered organization. So all of this and the work we've been doing for the last 15 years, our organization just turned 15 years old last week. Um, we are doing this work in order to develop and help increase the number of minority minority farmers and that's on the male and female side of things um again i thank you for this opportunity I, um, just being at the table with these wonderful innovators and um actual inventors if you will uh, my invention again is on the next generation and the actual book signing of my curriculum will happen hopefully in National Women's Month next month in March in Washington, D.C. So again, I, I just thank you all and I will be reaching out to these panelists to hopefully become mentors to some of our women at a panel or a conference um, that we have coming up in July in Atlanta at the second Virtual Women in Ag Conference. Again, Deepak, thank you and thank you ladies for letting me share this platform with you all. Well, thank you, Dr. Gray Steele. And actually, I wanted to see if all the panelists and speakers, if you're still on, let's turn your cameras on and give yourself a big round of applause. That was an amazing time with everybody. And then, Fatma, are you there? There you are. All right. Thank you, guys. Take a big bow, a virtual bow. Thank you again for attending today's session. It was amazing. Uh, this, I'm, I'm in like, uh, no technical glitches or anything for once, so we're good. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to, uh, to myself, and I am going to display the QR code. So hopefully everybody can get their cell phones out. It's that magical time of the show where you get to provide us feedback. Did you like our program? Your feedback is valuable for us to create the next program. Um, while that code is going to be displayed, I want to talk about some of the other resources that the USPTO has. Uh, one of our newest resources is the IP identifier um, tool. This is something new. It was revamped, and this kind of helps you determine where you are um, along your intellectual property journey. It is a self-assessment, and it kind of helps you identify um, things that you can do to, to increase your knowledge of intellectual property. So quick plug for the new tool that just came out. Uh, and I also, this is perfect timing to have this panel because tomorrow is day one of a three-day program for Women Entrepreneurship Symposium. So day one is tomorrow. We have great panels uh, going on tomorrow and is at 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Please, you can find out more information at uspto.gov forward slash 
W-E-S. And the registration links and everything will be there. Uh, so please sign up. Day one is tomorrow. Day two is on March 15th. And day three is March 29th. Um, and I think they're all around the same time. All right. And finally, before I leave you guys, I cannot uh, tell you how excited we are that InventionCon 2023, we have the dates locked in. They are May 10th, May 11th, and May 12th. And the first two days will be completely virtual, but we will be opening the doors at USPTO headquarters for day three of InventionCon on Friday, May 12th. So stay tuned for further details. Uh, you'll be able to see it on our event uh, page, and you'll also be see our upcoming program information at uspto.gov forward slash innovation for all. With that, I'd like to close today's program and thank everybody for attending. Have a great one. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.